since we're, this is a presidential honor, I want to go back to 2009. You're at the White House. <laughs> yes. What are you thinking when you're playing in front of the Obamas? I mean, I'm super nervous. I mean, I look back at the video and like, I'm just grinning like this the entire time. <laughs> I cannot like move my mouth. I'm thinking to myself, why am I grinning so much? I should tone it down, but I'm like, I can't. <laughs> I'm just like nodding very nervously. But it was just uh, amazing. I, I, it, was, it was a wonderful opportunity to be in that room, to meet President Obama, to perform this song that Lynn had written. Uh, you know, we didn't know what was going to become of any of that. We didn't even know it was going to be filmed or seen in that way. We were just happy to be in that room. Yeah, that day was like a sneak preview of how surreal life would get. We started by splitting a van with James Earl Jones to the White House. And I was like, the day could have ended there and it would have been like the highlight of my life. We were in a van with James Earl Jones. Um, and then, you know, the performance went as well as it went yeah. and the video went viral and here we are. Give people a sense of the risk of that. I mean, mm -hmm. the, 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 nobody would seen this and it was not obviously a form that people were expecting. Um, and you're, by the way, in, in the video, you're sp basically spitting at the president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I, was very, I, I was probably as nervous as I've ever been in my life uh, in that moment because I was both um, premiering something new, something only my closest collaborators and my wife had heard. She wasn't even my wife yet. Um, and I, um, but I also was really proud of it and I wanted it to go well. And I also re remember thinking, like, if this room doesn't get it, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I, I, I remember how well the sound check went, mm -hmm. and I remember we met the Obamas before we performed. Mm -hmm. So it was like they didn't have a sense of what was coming, and um, it was just um, it was it was an electric moment, and it was a sneak preview of what was what was going to come. I just, you know. There was a lot of work between writing one song and writing a whole show. Yeah, we're going to get to that, that work yeah. in a minute. <laughs> um, Tommy, you grew up in this area. Now you're here getting a Kennedy Center honor. I mean, what is that like? It's not something that I was thinking about when I was six years old, you know, going to see the Nutcracker. Being like, why am I dressed in a bow tie? <laughs> a lot of like, upset pictures of me like in that, in that hallway. Um, I, I mean, it's... You know, it's something that I find uh, meaningful in a way that uh, I think Lynn has maybe had a chance to experience being someone who has had his hometown be the place where he's made his work. I remember going to Miami with Alex when we took in the Heights there <laughs> and seeing what that felt like. And because, uh, uh, you know, my experience here and taking this show, which I feel like is so much of who I am, and having it be in that same hallway and, and you, know, in, you know, walking down that hall of flags and seeing a show that I had something to do with play there, uh, it feels both uh, out of body and, and yet um, like an arrival. And yeah. so it's been in incredibly moving for me. I mean, the red carpet, the bust of, of Kennedy, I mean, the iconic things of your... Of yeah, your I mean, youth. it's what every six-year-old dreams of, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> someday I'll make a musical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was growing up at that time, I was playing soccer and baseball and chasing some ball around some field. It didn't occur to me that people made shows. I didn't know anybody that did that. So if I saw a movie, I wasn't waiting for the credits to see if there was a director or a writer. I just thought, that's nice that this story is being presented to me in some way. So it was just, uh, it, was, uh, it was this other world that I didn't know existed, and the Kennedy Center made it available to me as, uh, as a young kid. And so to be back there as someone who makes stuff, sharing it with other young kids, really just knocked me out. Andy, there are awards given uh, in categories. Then there is this award, which is basically being given to you all because you have done something, well, I'll read what it says. Trailblazing creators of a transformative work that defies category. So they created a new category because what you've created. It's the created. best way to win an award. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Well, it's also wonderful that you know, the, the Broadway theater, the American musical theater, is something that is uniquely American and taking its roots in, in very American uh, musical forms. Uh, it's swing music, dance music of the jazz era, uh, popular music of the 40s and 50s. And so it is a, it, it is a very American form. But in its most crystal form, it's also a for something that's all about collaboration. It's not a singular effort. And so the Broadway musical is based on minds coming together, problem solving, creating, being inspired. And so it's great to be honored in that way too because it really is a team effort. But they are saying teams have worked before. So let's yeah. talk about your team. They're saying yeah. teams have worked before, but it turns out this team has done something no other team has done before. Well, I think it's a couple things. We're, we're speaking in words that um, maybe are new words. 
uh, dance language, musical language, story language. Um, it's aggressive storytelling and it's uh, forward thinking, but it's about something that happened to all of us and is imprinted in our DNA. So I think that's also part of the power of the whole thing, is that we're taking something that people feel so deeply, it resonates in us so deeply, the American journey, the struggles of the family, the fights of both independence and voice. Those are things that we all know in our DNA. We're just saying it in a way that feels new, but reminds us of something that we know already. Right. A new that way we, to that we'd forgotten we knew. Right. A new way to touch something yeah. old and elemental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Let's talk about the process. Um, take me in. Where is it happening, Lynn? Is it happening at a breakfast table? Is it happening in texts? Where is this collaboration taking place in its various different times? For the first few years, it was just happening in my head on vacations, <laughs> on various vacations, because uh, it was always it would always pop up then. It was like the ghost of Hamilton would be like, "Hey, write write a song for King George," um, <laughs> which got written on my honeymoon. Um, and I think finally, I'd written like two or three songs, and and I finally. I performed one of the songs at a fundraiser for Ars Nova, which is a theater we work with a lot. And Tommy was like, we should start setting deadlines because if you're gonna average a song a year, this is gonna take us a very long time. Uh, and so we set our first deadline was a, a concert we did at Lincoln Center's, uh, jazz at Lincoln Center. Uh, it was on Hamilton's birthday, January 11th. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, we put a mark in the sand and said, all right, six months from now, we're gonna perform everything you've got. And so I wrote, I write to the deadline, and so, I mean, I remember nine we, did, or ten songs, we did like nine or ten songs there, mm -hmm. um, and it was, I got a great piece of advice from uh, playwright John Weidman. He said, don't try to put the whole book yeah. on stage. Just write the parts you think you want to see in a musical. Mm -hmm. And so in that concert, we did Helpless, um, him meeting his wife for the first time. We did Say No to This, The Affair. We did My, uh, Man. We did my Shot. Right Hand Man meeting George Washington. The rap battles. Uh, we did the rap battles, just testing that out with the mics and seeing how that would play. We closed with the opening number, um, and because uh, we didn't have the duel yet, uh, <laughs> and and I remember singing the our opening number as our closing number and seeing Andy in the audience. Something like this. Going like this. <laughs> <laughs> and being like, oh, Andy's gonna end up choreographing this. <laughs> and when you're watching that, Andy, what, all of that new stuff is coming into your head. How are you processing it? Are you, are your are feet moving already? You know, the, beat, the beat was everywhere. And that's what is so special about what Lynn and Alex do, is that whether it's a ballad tempo or the fastest tempo in the show, the organic beat underneath move, moves us emotionally. And so it's easy to dance to. So there's many a number that these folks write together that, that end up not dancing, but they could. They, they dance in their souls, because they're about action. They're about things that must be said or must be done. Um, so as I was hearing the music, like every single song inspired me, I was also really transported immediately by not knowing what it was. Like it wasn't a linear, normal musical. It could have been a hip hop song cycle that was a record. And yeah, could have lived, it could have lived thought. like that. And so, yeah. so being that it was so out of the box in that it wasn't trying to be a musical, it actually even exploded my brain even more because then, it, then you could throw all the paint against the wall because they took the rules out of it already. And, and so that was really, really inspiring to me. And then the backdrop to their concert was the New York skyline. I mean, it was in front of the windows at Jazz Lincoln Center. And so there I was with my wife on like a perfect Manhattan night yeah. hearing this moving thing. And, I, and, and it, that was actually like the, these guys for the White House, like the first step for me to say, oh, this is going to be Un, unreal, an unreal journey. And so then, uh, Alex, where does the story go from there? Uh, it usually starts when Lynn emails a demo of the song. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and me, does it come out of the blue, the demo? You're just, you're getting, you got a LinkedIn uh, notification, then suddenly you got... Not even, it's just attached on a Gmail. <laughs> very, very simple. But what's amazing is that with Lynn's demo, it's like the spark is always there. Like there's always a hook, there's always something that just grabs you. And you know, my job is to interpret, basically. Like the song comes and then I'm like, okay, how do we get a band to play this? How do we get singers to harmonize in chords to support what the story is, what to support what the melody is. So uh, it's, for me, it's intuition, but it's also just a lot of chemistry. And I th that's what I think all four of us have, because you could pick four other people, you know, a different choreographer, a different director, a different uh, a songwriter, and it wouldn't click in this way. But for whatever reason, there's just a certain kind of 
DNA, certain kind of uh, common language amongst all of us that it all just kind of clicks in. And you know, wow. it's just speak to the demos for a second. Like Lynn's demos are gold, yeah. um, and because they continue to evolve and grow. But I remember one time I was at the gym on the treadmill and I couldn't figure out a number for In the Heights. And I went back to the earliest demo that Lynn, that Lynn had sent, and the song had changed a great deal, but it just had an essence in it that you're like, oh, that's what his truth is. That's what he's trying to say. So then you can go back to the evolved work after it has changed and still ret retrofit Lynn's instinct in there. So th those demos are really almost like a biography, I think, of his composing mind. So okay. that those original demos are kind of the nugget of the thing. And the, yeah. yeah. And, and the thing about these demos is, in a way, it's like a, it's a charting of the course of an idea. So it's, it's like a diary. And a lot of our job collectively, and my job in particular with each of these three, is to remind them of where they started. Yeah. You know, what, what, what was the impulse? What was the instinct? What was the spark? Because sometimes you can work a thing too much. All of us can. And sometimes the best note is go back. Sometimes the best note is just leave it alone. Right. It's already there. And I think that there's so much faith and trust in each other that you can bring in something that might be a seed. And you also sometimes can bring in a forest. Like, Lynn has sent us something where we're like, so we're done, let's move on. Um, when Andy showed us Room Where It Happened, I was like, what's the next song? Because there's nothing to contribute here, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think you also have to, uh, you have to be there for each other in that way and try to understand um, through shared experience what that person might need at that moment. Yeah. And, and again, the four of us for our show are just, you know, four of, dozens and hundreds of people at this point are designers who have to also translate this. Our company, um, the, you know, the musicians, the producers who are trying to support and help shape and nourish this. So we are, you know, we're this part of uh, th this larger organism, but we also have very particular responsibilities to make sure that we're always really clear on what story we're trying to tell and how we're trying to tell it. Yeah. And I want to get at the idea of how you convey what the four of you were able to create into that huge company and, and, and how that process works. But, um, let me ask you this though, Lynn. So creative people have strong views, but you all have a collaboration where, um, as Tommy was just saying, he reminds you of yourself if you maybe get lost in the weeds or in the, but how does that work when, in collaboration, if you've, you're putting yourself out there, creation is a naked experience, and then somebody says, nah, that's, you gotta, how do you not basically get on each other's nerves? Oh, well, I think that we respond to each other's energy in a way that's really positive. Tommy has a way of setting a room where the best idea in the room wins. And, you know, if I bring in a song and I see Andy's already leapt to his feet and Alex is already playing with variations, I'm like, okay, we're pretty far along the course. If I bring in a song and it's quiet, I go, Okay, <laughs> swing and a miss, um, and, but um, these guys are never prescriptive. It's never the song needs to do this or the song needs to do this. It's, all right, here was my, we can go back to basics of here was my intent, here is what you're hearing, and how do we shorten the distance between my intent and, and what you're getting. Um, and that's sort of always what we're doing, and then that happens in a larger sense when we get an audience. It's, we're, we're trying to, Everything that is being hailed as an innovation is an attempt by us to eliminate any distance between the story and an audience. You know, anything that would be like, this is other, this is not my experience, I feel like I've seen this, this is a history book. We're just trying to sweep all the cobwebs away. Um, and, and everything from the music to the costumes to, to everyone's choices here are just um, to make it feel as immediate uh, and gripping as possible. I, I think one of the rarest things, and maybe what is the miracle of our collaboration, is that we actually do finish each other's sentences, and what works for one person innately works for the next person. I remember in our entire time doing three shows now together, the only time Lynn ever said to me, that doesn't look like I thought it was gonna look when I heard the music in my head, happened one time. Like of all the times that I've made the choice to physicalize things in a certain way. And so I think that we just innately follow the same river. Like we are just in that, that, that course flying it together. And, and it just makes sense for all of us. It's not like your sensibility is totally different from mine, so let me figure you out. Somehow our, sen our, our instincts just meet. Yeah, and there's a Venn diagram that intersects at the core if you were to take how the four of us approach the work or see the work. And so you have this thing in the center of it that feels like it's got these four layers. And then there are things that Andy can do and see 
that I never could, and things that Lynn can do and see that we never could, and same with Alex. And so that actually makes the thing broader based, yeah. because Venn diagrams are always about, well, what's the thing that intersects in the middle? But if you look at it and think about how much bigger the shape is because of that contribution, then I think you're growing the organism. And I, I also feel that each of us believe, because we sort of respectively lead our own departments, right? I mean, right. that's Alex running the band and teaching the, the company, um, you know, uh, how to articulate and story tell with music, and then we collaborate on that. Um, Andy, obviously, with his departments. You know, my feeling about it is we all understand instinctively that the stakes can be high and the temperature of the room can be low, and that you can make excellent things with harmony. That this can be proof that it's possible to make something of high quality that didn't uh, result from acrimony or, uh, you know, or raising your voice. If nothing else, that's one of the things that, that I hope the, yeah. becomes part of the legacy of the show. Making a Broadway musical, I think, is such an interesting art form because you have all of these different designers that are all trying to serve the piece. You, know, you have the choreographer, you have the lighting designer, you have the costumes. Hamilton is a show where I felt like every single designer was all going towards the same direction because the material was so strong and so visceral. I, I remember thinking to myself, like, I do not want to ruin this because everything that Lynn has given us is so amazing. And I know that every designer brought their A game because they all wanted to serve this piece. But I really do think, as Andy said, it was a miracle that everybody all was going in the same direction, looking at the same goal, feeling the same feelings, and, and, and seeing the same uh, uh, final product. It's we really brought you together because we wanted to tell you something. You ruined it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so guys, yeah. thank you so yes. much. Yes, yes. <laughs> I don't think it's going to fly. But Alex, was there ever a dark moment? In all creative, maybe you had them individually, but was there ever a moment where you thought, gee, rap about having states' debts assumed by the federal government, that's not going to fly? I, I remember the first time Lynn brought the demo to me and I heard it and it was, my first reaction was I couldn't tell if it was trying to be tongue in cheek, was it trying to be funny? I, I was so uh, uh, taken because it was so different, I didn't know what to expect. And even when we performed it here at the White House, I remember a lot of the reactions where it was, uh, there's a lot of laughter happening. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, how are people going to in interpret this? Because even after that performance, whenever I would explain Hamilton to people, it's impossible to explain it. You say to them, it's a hip hop show about a founding father, and everyone just kind of cocks their head, and they would say, oh, okay, that's interesting. But, but I say, you have to see it, you have to hear it, and then they would understand. So it wasn't until a year later until I heard my shot, and I heard that chant, I am not throwing away my shot, and I started to see, oh my God, Lynn is dead serious about this. And it really started to, uh, to fill me with something, it, and it was like American pride. There was yeah. something about that that I just felt, oh my God, I never pictured the founding fathers with this kind of energy, with this kind of passion and drive and, and perseverance. And it started to wake up my, my understanding of American history in a way that I did not expect. Now, given the journey you on, you've been on, it must be actually kind of refreshing for somebody to say, Hamilton, what's that? Because, I mean, it's so much a part of the conversation now. Um, Lynn, tell me, w when you're doing this creation, is there a shorthand you use? I mean, when you're talking the four of you, have, did you are there ways that you... <laughs> You have you ever seen I'm the guessing from the laughter that there is. <laughs> <laughs> it's just whatever makes Andy feel excluded. Yeah. Usually, <laughs> he usually works like that. No, um, gosh, I don't know. I think that, um, I think the shorthand is, you know, this is, we've worked together a long time now. We, we all met in what, 2007, five, five. 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've been through lots of different experiences. And so you bring all of that to bear. It's, yeah. it's, it's really like a, a marriage or a band or anything else. And so, um, you know, my favorite thing to do in this collaboration is when I get to bring a new song yeah. into the room and, and let everybody at it. You know, it's it's because um, I know my work's going to get better as a result, uh, yeah. as they, being in the same room as these guys. And, um, and, and then here's the other funny thing that happens to me, because again, I was, I was in this one. Um, <laughs> so I didn't see the show for a while. You know, I didn't see, the, and, and I remember seeing uh, the opening number for the first time with, with my alternate Javier Munoz on, and me sitting in the audience, and there, were, there are things you can't see from the eye of the hurricane. And I, I, I think the moment that, moved me to tears so much, like right off the bat, was the closing moment of the opening number, and it's Alexander Hamilton, boom. And Hamilton is looking out, and everyone else has their heads bowed. And I didn't know that happened, because I was 
being Hamilton. And it's so moving on so many levels. To me, it speaks to how Hamilton is just about to start the journey of this story, and everyone else in the story knows how it ends. Um, and it just gives, I mean, just goose flesh every time yeah. I see it. And, and, um, and the caveat to that story is that the single day, the day I moved to New York City, I sat in the front row of the mezzanine and saw Jerome Robbins Broadway, and Jerome Robbins was my ultimate idol choreographically and in dance, and that's how the number ends. And so I was quoting the number that made me want more than anything to be in the Broadway theater. They, the full company end West Side Story with, with a bow of their heads. And so I was literally just paying homage to the person who inspired me the most, saying, let's follow in that person's footsteps. And Robbins is one of the first classes of the Kennedy Center honor. So it was like amazing this weekend to see the, the pictures of him. I, I think what Andy's speaking to also is something that we all feel very deeply, which is what's always um, slightly incongruous about uh, people that talk about our show as new or fresh or innovative, yeah. because it is the sum of all of our parts. And the stuff that we're made of, our moments like that, our Fiddler on the Roof, you know, our Rent, and this show is Sweeney Todd and Gypsy and Oklahoma and all of these things, as well as the, the, the music and the information that we took in through films, yeah. you know, The Matrix and, you know, Ratatouille we were talking about the other day, <laughs> as, and the music. So it's all of those things can exist here. And I think what we're trying to say is bring it in. Bring all of that in, make the door wider, yeah. and, and you can find something that reflects back yeah. your, your experience in a way that you didn't necessarily think could, could exist in the hallowed theater. Right. You, you, can still, you can respect the theater more than anything by acknowledging what came before and bringing that to your own sensibility. Yeah, sometimes in life I think the ego, many things, insecurities, makes us unable to look at something else and admit you're inspired by it, mm. to admit like, oh, that guy is great. I wanna, I wanna just bask in that. And we do that all, I think, pr pretty well. Like, we are very open about the things that, that, we are, that inspire us, that, that, that we idolize, um, the performers, the accomplishments, the songs, the musical styles. And most of those things were built out of something else, yeah. the need for somebody to articulate in song. And so those needs that were created in a song 50 years ago, 100 yeah. years ago, 10 years ago, those needs still exist in us. So there's this circular spin art thing that's happening in Hamilton where we, we're sort of revisiting things that made us learn how to live our lives, and that, both artistically and in humanity. And of course, that's what's connecting with all of us yeah. because you're pulling something out of us as well. That yeah. we have a moment that that is connecting in our lives recognize. to some. Yeah. Have you been surprised, um, Alex? Have you been surprised that people? It's I don't know if it's like the old um, story about the blind man and the elephant. I mean, so many people, you know, where one touches and says, "Oh, the, the elephant is like the tusk," and the other person touches the foot and says, "The elephant oh, is okay. like the foot." <laughs> so many people with Hamilton pick different parts about it and have this deep energy about it. Has that been surprising? Uh, I don't know that it's been surprising, but I, I think there's so much to love about Hamilton. There's so many different uh, things that one can pull out of it. Uh, every, I think if you ask all four of us what Hamilton is about, we, you will get four different answers. You can ask everyone, everyone out there what they think Hamilton's about or what their favorite part is or what their interpretation of it is. You will have different answers. And I think that's one of the best parts about art that is that there is no real finite answer. Even the creator might have a thing that he was trying to get across, but someone else will pull something else out of it that they might not have been expecting. And that is what is wonderful about art. It's like looking at a sculpture. And one of my favorite things to do is to walk around the entire thing and observe it from every angle and look at the back of the head and see what the hair looks like from back there or look down at the foot and see what that is. And th there's something to be gained and some beauty to be seen from every aspect. And even for me, I will watch the show to this day and see something that I hadn't seen before. I'll see a step that Andy did that I didn't realize was there. I'll, I'll see a placement of an actor that I didn't know that uh, Tommy had placed them there. Uh, so there's always something new to see and uh, that's one of my favorite things about what it is that we do. It reminds me of being a kid and listening to a record and upon the 50th time hearing a song realizing, oh, I didn't realize the bass did that at that moment and it just keeps giving. So Lynn, are you, are you all still collaborating on this work? I mean, once this energy and this thing is going, but when do you put your pen, when do you put the pen down and the test is over? <laughs> oh, I put the pen down when we opened, pretty much. I mean, but, but the collaboration doesn't end. Right. Mm -hmm. Because um, Hamilton being what it is, it requires lots of decisions every day and, and, and 
what no one tells you when you embark on a musical is that you're married to the people you made the musical with in a real way for the rest of your life because you're the custodians of the work. In theater, you own the work. Um, so just the way, you know, Kiara and I, who co-wrote In the Heights with me, still make decisions about In the Heights every day, and we're making decisions about the movie version that is coming out now, and all these guys worked on that as well. You know, we, we are custodians of the work in a very real way. We're very involved in all the tours that are going yeah, on. I mean, and and, and, and to, to, to the point of casting, I mean, we're still, um, we're still crafting this show. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the production has an integrity, and it has a, a vision that is both specific and, and powerful. So when we do open a new company, there is a responsibility to cater it to their individuality and their individual skill set without losing the integrity of the piece. Mm -hmm. And so we've been very good at keeping our hands on the clay, because yeah. that's a difficult process too, because we want somebody in London or Arizona to see the same idea. Yeah. We don't want it to feel like it's a third generation Xerox copy right. or something. And Tommy says this all the time, actually, the Richard Rogers is only a 1300 seat theater, so more people are experiencing Hamilton on tour than they are on Broadway. I mean, they are the, they're the true, the tours are really the true ambassadors of the show at this point. Right, and Tommy, Tommy how do you convey what you, this special thing, which people are, can now witness in the conversation you've had here, to the broader company, to, and, and to, to other cities. Those are, the, those are the days Tommy makes everyone cry. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> because he's so eloquent. Yes, because Tommy's he's so eloquent. eloquent. <laughs> right, you move them to tears. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think that's one, of the, <clears throat> that's one of the things that I love about the opportunity to go and make these new companies, is that we're still refining. I might say something, giving an adjustment to an actor in, a, in an audition, someone who might not even get the part, that I realize is a better crystallization of an idea than I've been using for the last couple years. And so you bring that into the room. Mm -hmm. So we get better at what we do, that evolves. And then I think it's really incumbent uh, on, on us and on the other people that are helping us mount these tours from our departments to, to talk about some of those more ineffable things, to talk about the ideas, to mm -hmm. never compare one company to the other, but to talk about where an idea was incepted where the thing was created and why it was created. Because if you understand the storytelling, then you understand what Andy is doing. Yeah. And, if you, and if you are able to imbue and endow that company with that kind of information, then their ability to bring a, a, a show to any of these cities that we get to visit is just as full and complete as it can be. So if they understand the source code, then they can... Right. Right. There's a lot of DNA talk, own. as you well, hear with yeah, this. Well, yeah, you know, know. Like trying to get in on it. If you lived an experience with somebody, you don't have to explain it. You both lived yeah. it. And so like, even in our original company, we had worked with probably 75, 85% of that company on other shows. So they knew all of our shorthand. They, I, I wouldn't have to really explain a dance step because my associate, Stephanie, would just understand or, what, what I was trying to accomplish. So there wasn't the need for words when you had relationships that were years and years old. So as we go to new companies, those relationships are actually now brand new for the most part. So we have to have them go to school with us, so to speak. So even if it's George Washington doing it, you're using the vocabulary of of all kinds of different previous dance. Yeah, yeah, but also but also previous relationships. Yeah. Like Chris Jackson, like we have an experience with Chris Jackson. So you go into the staging of the show in a way that's totally different words or totally different uh, groundwork than somebody who you're actually meeting and de developing a new relationship with. Describe what uh, how Washington moves on the stage. Uh, well, just describe how you would explain the way Washington moves. Well, I mean, state. like Right Hand Man is a great example because Right Hand Man was always um, supposed to be like Washington stepping out of an oil painting. Like we see him as this thing that is in an oil painting. Mm -hmm. He's so grand. He's a god to us, and the bullets never hit him. And and so the way that I always imagined Right Hand Man to be was like a pop up video, like VH1 pop up video, and like Washington steps out of his own oil painting, and the pop ups continue all around him. He can he goes back into it. He goes back out of it. And so throughout the show, there's these different concepts for number to number, but Washington was quite easy because Washington rides on that stallion and never gets hit by a bullet. So he actually separates himself from the rest of the cast in that number. That's, I've literally never heard you describe it that way before, which is amazing. But because <laughs> what's funny for me is the fun of writing writing Right Hand Man was, it was exactly pulling Washington down off the oil painting. It was, mm -hmm. let's not meet Washington standing, crossing the Delaware, somehow not falling off this tiny canoe. Let's <laughs> meet him being like, 
I don't have enough money, I don't have enough troops, and we're losing, um, which is the opposite of how he has painted yeah. in every portrait and, in history. And the exceptional thing about all those details that are flying through his head, those details are flying through his head while bullets are flying at his head. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's able to do like 10 things at once. Like that's the character I wanted to, to develop was right. somebody who could think like Hamilton on 10 levels while he's doing another action. Well, and, and Hamilton is so much about pride and hubris, and so you have this great figure coming out and saying, in my first battle, I got my butt kicked. Yeah. Right? Which is, you have the deity teaching a lesson in humility. Anyway, I won't, yeah. I won't tell you what you've created. But I, but I think that there, but you're hitting on something, and I think that these three are speaking to it really well. That this city is a series of monoliths. You know, I grew up in Northern Virginia, in the, the shadow of Mount Vernon. And, you know, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and, and, and these beings never feel like they actually existed because you are only seeing them out of human scale. And what we endeavored to do was to make them human scale yeah. and remind you of what it meant to be on the ground in the visceralness of the movement, in the vitality of the music, and in the richness of the performance. Which is why the audiences can connect, because it's real. It's not on some monument. Um, let me ask you about the audience, Lynn. Meryl Streep talked about, when acting, that all your pores are open to take readings from the audience. What was that like at first, and then how did that evolve as Hamilton became what it became? Well, it was, it was always sort of the most thrilling ride um, of my life. And, to play Alexander Hamilton is to eat a 14-course meal every night. You get to experience the entire spectrum of human behavior. You fall in love. You experience grief. You fight a war. You gr I mean, it's 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 uh, it is a, it's a dream. It's a dream role. Um, and and the weird irony is that it's the most. The two hours and 40 minutes when I got to play Hamilton were the most relaxing of my day. <laughs> uh, because it was the only time when I only had one job. It required my full focus. I knew that audience made miracles happen to be in that theater that night. And you could feel that electricity every night. And they powered the show. The yeah. audience powers the show. And uh, your job is to ride that energy and, and live a life in two hours and 40 minutes. And it's, uh, it's, uh, I've never experienced anything like it. Alex, did. With what has happened with Hamilton, do you think, well, this is what I always thought art could do? Or mm. have you experienced something where you think the reaction to it and the way people talk about it, actually this is something that's new in my conception of the effect art could have on people's lives? I consider myself very lucky in that I just follow where I'm led. I go where the heat is. and. Uh, I can't explain it. All I know is that I'm drawn to something. I feel a magnetic pull and I go towards it. Um, I never worked on the show. I never worked with these people because I thought to myself, oh, I want to make art and I want to make something that's really going to be important. I just wanted to hang out with these guys and, like, <laughs> and do what I feel like I do best, which is sit down at a piano and, and, and try to uh, uh, have some fun, have a dialogue. Uh, most of what I do uh, is to try to fill a space. For example, uh, Lim will write a melody and there will be an inherent uh, void. There'll be a bar of rest. And I think to myself, what can I do in that bar of rest to just add a flavor, to like compliment, to finish a sentence, to, to, to uh, articulate a thought, and then get out of the way so that the vocal continues. So that's the way that I find, okay, this is how I can contribute. This is how I can accompany. This is how I, I get to play. So for me, like to this day, all I'm ever thinking about is what would be the most fun thing to do at this moment? What would be the thing that would make me smile? What would be the thing that my buddy who I grew up with when I was a kid would listen to and be like, oh, I saw that reference you did for, that, that references the bass player of Rush. Or like, yeah. oh yeah, I, I heard that little lick that you threw in, that's, that's a so Miles Davis Rush thing that you did. Yeah, yeah, I know, I mean, references. my God. But uh, yeah, it, it's, um, I, and I, I say this often, I feel like everything in my life led me to this moment and every friend that I had and every record that I listened to and, and every history book that I read, whatever it is, uh, allowed me to be able to contribute in the way that I can to the work that I do with these gentlemen. And I'm ever grateful for everything that ever happened to me. And it's just because I think to myself, okay, I, I just want to make music. I just want to make art. A show powered by joy. Yeah.
pretty for good. Me, for me, anyway. Yeah. Um, tell me, have you been surprised about anything in the way this has been, uh, the reaction that has come with the show? Because with creation of art, you create a thing, you all collaborate, and then it lives in the world. The child goes out, and then it might come back with tattoos and nine <laughs> ear piercings, or it might come back as a Baptist minister. You just don't know. What's that experience like, and, and how have you reacted to the way Hamilton has become? I think my job in the rehearsal room, and before we get into the rehearsal room, is to be the audience. So if it's just me and Lynn talking, then I represent the audience. When I get into the theater, my job is to listen to the audience, to read the audience, to still what they might be telling us, and see how that can inform what we're going to put out into the world. But at a certain point, you have to understand that the momentum that the show is going to either generate or not generate is beyond your control. So sometimes you're on the wave, sometimes you're paddling like heck, and you can't get on the wave. And if you're on the wave, what you want to do is make sure that you have your balance and your wits about you to stay on it. So the intensity and the depth of people's response has been humbling at every turn. I've been surprised by how young our, our audiences and some of our youngest fans really are. Mm -hmm. I have nieces and nephews that heard really early demos that were three and five at the time, and I thought they just loved me a lot, and so they were being nice. I didn't know that eventually five and six-year-olds all over the, the country and all over the world would know every lyric to that opening number. That, that, was, that was stunning to me. And so I, I think that that has surprised me. And, and I just want to say, you know, something that Alex was just speaking to uh, made me think about collaboration in, in a way that, you know, that, that feels like he's, he's touching on something really important, that maybe collaboration is when your contribution is recognized and heard. And so we're always trying to put the thing that makes us feel useful into the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the world says we don't want it, or it shrugs, or it closes a door. And we've all heard the word no way more than we've heard the word yes. Sometimes maybe is all you need. And if our job in, in collaborating with each other and with the rest of our group is to say, maybe, let me see, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you, you're opening the door to possibility that doesn't exist when you already have the idea locked in your mind as what it, what it has to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the thought of feeling accessed that Alex is talking about mm -hmm. is what this show does for every company member who gets to move through uh, the physical patterns of the show and the choreography, that gets to sing these, these lyrics, sing these melodies, and tell the story. Right. But not only that, what you made me think of as well is a lot of what we do can be so solitary. Like I can picture Andy pacing in his room trying to figure out a step. I can figure out, I can see Lynn with his headphones walking across the George Washington Bridge trying to come up with a lyric. <laughs> you know, I, uh, we all kind of follow these individual things. And even when I'm in my room writing, I'm thinking to myself, well, what are they gonna think? Will these guys like it? Like, will it measure up? But when we get in the room and they finally get to hear it and it sparks something, it will either, as Tommy said, be like, yes, let's continue, or maybe not this, how about that? Instead, yeah. even if it starts that dialogue, like yeah. that, that's what I live for. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I think I it's, do theater. It's to be able to get in a room with other people and not be alone and to yeah. be able to like Absolutely. talk and to be able to, to uh, uh, just, uh, um, just have that link. That, that transition from solitary to group is also both hugely exciting and hugely daunting. Yeah. Like I, I, I'll never forget that one of the scariest moments for me in this show was when Lynn finished the, the new finale, the Hamilton side of the duel, and I just simply did not know what to do with it. And like I, I, the idea of spoken word scared the heck out of me, and I pulled an all-nighter, and I went to get on the subway uh, about 8.45 on the way to work, and I, and I choreographed that on the subway platform. It just hit me. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the, for the, you know, he wrote the show like the third day before we finished rehearsals, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and no yeah, ideas were Yeah, I finished the duel just before tech. No, no ideas were coming. I write to deadline. Yeah. But it's, but it's that <laughs> idea of having to go back into the yeah. group and say, like Alex was saying, maybe it's not good enough. Like it's scary, because everyone yeah, is such at the top of their game. To, to, keep, to know where that bar is is a little intimidating. I, I would love to do this all day. I know you guys have a, <laughs> an incredible deadline. So just one last question, Lynn. Is Hamilton still in your head? The, the person? The person? No, I think the person's going to be all right. Um, it, it's funny. Hamilton exists because um, that story was too good not to tell, and I couldn't believe it hadn't been told in this form. Um, it just it seemed like someone else would have had this idea already. Um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful that I found the right collaborators to help get it out of my head and get it out of the void and, and into the world.